ADHD and how current practices within schools are often not helping these children with ADHD and what we need to change. So ADHD is a developmental impairment. And it's, an unusual, it's unusual as a condition because it's defined solely by its two sets of symptoms, inattention and hyperactivity, impulsivity. Unfortunately, we still encounter misconceptions about ADHD, the main one being that it doesn't exist. There are just naughty children who now have a label. But through research and brain imaging, we now know far more about what ADHD actually is. And it's this greater understanding which reveals the inadequacy of what we actually do in schools to support them. So we know now that there's usually a developmental delay in the executive functions of the brain. So things like inhibition, emotion regulation, and planning. Now, while there's no absolute consensus as to what causes these symptoms, leading experts such as Gabor Mate have argued that the vast majority of cases of ADHD are actually due to an attachment disorder. Now, this is where a secure attachment between the child and the primary caregiver has failed to establish. Now, this isn't about blaming parents. This can arise from a number of reasons. But where there is a lack of attachment, there tends to be a powerful drive for social interaction and to gain the attention and approval of others. And this may be explaining some of the behaviors we see in the classroom. Now, even if we don't take the position of Gabor, Gabor Mate that nearly all cases of ADHD are due to an attachment disorder, it's surely worth considering that not only are children with ADHD lacking inhibition and have high anxiety, but they may also lack attachment. So what happens in schools? Well, in primary schools, there tends to be a reliance on praise and the promise of rewards. So when I worked in a primary school, with excellent teachers, I was given some well-meaning advice. I was due to start work with a seven-year-old boy, let's call him Billy. He'd been having a difficult time, and he'd often been reluctant to engage in tasks. And I was told to keep reminding him of his reward that he would get if he completed those tasks. Now, the reward he had chosen was 10 minutes playing Marble Run, the game where you build a structure and you drop marbles down. A classic choice. I think we can all agree that he had excellent taste. But little did I know that within minutes of the lesson starting, I would be stood at the bottom of a tree trying to convince Billy to come down. Clearly, I've got something wrong here. Tree climbing was not the learning intention. It was actually a spelling uh, activity, so zero trees should have been involved. So, the, on the face of it, using the promise of rewards should be something to motivate the child. So, with Billy, he loved Marble Run, so why did it not motivate him to at least start those activities? Instead, his fight or flight response was triggered, and he literally ran and climbed away to safety away from the threat he perceived. Now, we all perceive threats differently. So let's have a show of hands. Who would hate now to come up to the front and sing a song? OK, all volunteer? No, I'm only joking. But for those of you who are desperate not to sing, I could offer you some rewards. Yeah? And as long as you really valued those, you may agree to come up and sing. But you probably wouldn't feel any less stressed because I've not addressed any of the reasons why you didn't want to sing in the first place. So, the promise of rewards is that it's based on an assumption, the assumption that a lack of incentive is the issue. But there are other problems with using rewards, especially with children with ADHD. One is that, by their very nature, they're in the future. Well, if you have impulsivity, delaying gratification is very difficult. So even if they are excited by that reward and enjoy it, they may not be motivated anyway. But what does promising reward actually communicate? Well, firstly, in the case of Billy, that the learning task, the spelling test, was worth the reward he was promised, the time playing marble run, which he valued greatly. So I've not played down fear of failure. If anything, I've increased it. Secondly, and more concerningly, it begins to associate self-worth with performance. 
It's about what you can do, not who you are. Now, if I'm the one promising those rewards and giving that excessive praise when he completes a task, he now starts to think that my regard for him is based or is conditional on his performance. Now, this could be damaging for any child, but especially for one who may lack attachment and where that relationship with a member of staff is really important. So what happens in secondary schools? Well, things change quite a lot. And now there's more of a reliance on punishment to discourage undesirable behaviors. And we do this through the threat of sanctions, the threat of detention, isolation. Again, the problem here is the threat is in the future. If I lack inhibition, why would it deter me if I'm struggling in that lesson? But again, being in isolation and detention, which we can all imagine would be difficult for somebody who's impulsive and maybe seeking attachment and so wants to talk to their peers, is going to be difficult and they're likely to get into more trouble. But they're not going to learn from the experience. They're not going to wake up the next day any less impulsive. So what did these punishments actually do? Well, they've only served to make them feel rejected by the school. So again, the problem with the punishments is they're not, they're not being effective, they're not bringing about change. Now, despite all of this, they may still be doing well in their favorite subjects. They're interested, they're engaged, they're learning. But then sometimes we see this as a sign of choice. If you can get it right in this lesson, why not in that one? But this is really dangerous. We know that ADHD is situational. We know that it's based on context. So different lessons will offer different threats, different challenges, different ways of working. But if we're going to accuse them of choosing, we end up sending a message. We might not even be saying that explicitly. But through the detentions, through the isolations, through the report cards, the phone calls home, the temporary exclusions, we start to say, you're in control and you're making the wrong choices. You are to blame and you are failing. The problem here is, is that we're giving them total accountability, all that responsibility for everything that's going wrong. Yet have we really met their needs? Have we really developed them the skills to have that responsibility? So what's the alternative? I want to be clear that my criticism of praise, rewards, and punishments does not mean there's absolutely no place for them. Boundaries, routines, and structures are vital. They create stability and safety. But for some children with ADHD, punishments like isolation are at best a waste of time and are at worst exacerbating their symptoms. Now, there's incredible pressure on teachers to get academic results. And there's a severe lack of funding. So supporting children with complex needs in mainstream settings is incredibly challenging. But even in these very difficult, within these very difficult constraints, change is still possible. Now, I'm not proposing that we need unicorns as therapy animals in every school in the country. I'm not saying that whenever things get tricky, we send the children out to play Quidditch. But I believe we can do three things differently and we can do them now. One, we need to be far more curious about what behaviors in the classroom are actually communicating. Let's stop assuming that the lack of engagement in a learning activity is purely due to defiance or a lack of motivation. Secondly, we need to start to think about how we can meet their needs in the classroom. If you seek attachment, and so you're looking for that social interaction, how can we afford them the opportunity to do that, but in ways which relate to the learning? How can we reduce the pressure on performance? How can we reassure those who lack confidence? Now, we can show we care without using excessive praise. We can show our support and our positivity without promising rewards. And we can enforce boundaries without using isolation. Now, thirdly, we need to introduce mindfulness interventions. Mindfulness has been defined as the act of paying attention on purpose in the present moment without judgment. 
Now, with mindfulness activities, we can use things appropriate, we can use activities appropriate for that individual, being able to choose things to focus their awareness on, whether that be the body, the breath, or sounds. But what's crucial is that mindfulness has been shown to be effective in treating sleep disorders and reducing anxiety, two things which are common in children with ADHD and have a detrimental impact on learning and general well-being. But mindfulness can also start to address impulsivity. We start to recognize that we have a thought or impulse. We can now start to create some space between that thought and the action. And this is where we start to have choice. When we become conscious of a thought, we can now choose to accept it, to just be with it and let it pass on, or to act on it. And this is how we can develop self-responsibility. But also, but also, when we start to become aware of the emotions and self-judgments that children have about themselves, we can start to develop their self-acceptance. They can start to become more self-compassionate and therefore rely less on the, the validation of others. So, if in education we are going to profess the values of preparing our children for future challenges, we need to ensure that our support actually gives them the tools to overcome those challenges. So this isn't simply about preparing them for academic and economic success, but also about empowering them to meet the mental and emotional challenges of everyday life. And only through accommodating difference and developing self-responsibility, developing self-acceptance, can we truly start to help children with ADHD reach their full potential. Thank you for listening.